Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And today we're talking about Darwin. But not the one you think we're going to talk about, <laughs> unless you've been following our video channel a long time, in which case you know exactly who Mark's favorite Darwin is. Oh yes, the absolute best Darwin of all the Darwins is Erasmus Darwin. <laughs> so today you're going to find out so much more than you ever thought you could possibly need to know about the grandfather of Charles Darwin, Erasmus Darwin. This is based off of a video about Erasmus Darwin that Mark did several years ago now. So we'll be listening to the audio from that. But before we get started, we have a little bit of business. First of all, we have some new patrons to thank. So thank you to Ernest Olson and Janet Atwell, who are both new patrons on Patreon. Thank you so much. Thanks, you too. We also wanted to say thank you to G. Bromios, a username rather than a real name, I think, for increasing your contribution quite a lot. And we are very grateful for that support as well. Thank you. We really appreciate that. Yeah. If you want to check out our Patreon, you can go over to patreon.com slash endless knot and see what the levels are and help us out with some of the costs of producing the videos in the podcast. All right. Next up is our cocktails. Now tonight... <laughs> this is a surprise, a mystery cocktail. Well, I mean, you watched me make it, but you don't know why I made it. No. And it's a bit of a cheat, sort of. <laughs> so I was Googling for cocktails, as I usually do, and on a whim, I did Google Erasmus Darwin cocktail, assuming that there was no such thing in the entire world. Right. Instead, I found, I want you to open up the document that I put the show notes in for a moment, because there's a link I want you to go to, and it will take you to a PDF. I will obviously put this in the show notes as well. It will take you to a PDF of a cocktail menu from a bar, the current spring menu for this bar. Which is, read out what it says it is. This cocktail menu is inspired by our two loves, great literature and the wonderful world of botany. You'll notice a singular poem weaves its way through every drink, telling a story. This poem is entitled The Loves of the Plants, written by Erasmus Darwin, grandfather of the great Charles Darwin. So it is a cocktail <laughs> menu based entirely around the poem. poem that we are going to hear much about from a little later on. And not only that, but the menu lists 18 different drinks, each of which has a quotation from the poem oh. beside it. So uh, not to give away information about the poems, but the first one, Soft Notes, which is in fact sort of the drink I have made, I'll get back to that in a moment, has, while in soft notes I tune to oat and reed, gay hopes and amorous sorrows of the mead, from giant oaks that wave their branches dark, to the dwarf moss that clings upon their bark, what bow and beauties crowd the gaudy groves, and woo and win their vegetable loves. Right. Vegetable loves. Yes. So yes, each of the drinks has a quotation from the poem, it is entitled... Its title comes from a line of poetry. They list all the ingredients for the cocktail by their botanical names. <laughs> I mean, they list the ingredients right. and then they list all the botanicals the in those. Right. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Or at least most of them. Now, this is a bar menu, so they don't have exact that recipes for their cocktails. Right. Mm -hmm. And most of the cocktails have things in them that I can't easily make. Right. So I've had to fudge it. So I thought I would make the soft notes because it also has carbonated water in it. And I've used right. Schweppes soda water. And that also, dear listener, will become relevant as you listen to the audio. Now, the drink soft notes that they have on the bar menu here, Bluebird Cocktail Room, don't know where, <laughs> um, we can probably figure that out, is Koki Americano, Persian Lime, and Carbonated Water. Now, we don't have Koki Americano. I'm not even sure if we can get it at our LCBO. I've never mm. seen it there. So what I've done is I've used Lilette Blanc, which is somewhat similar. Okay. but does not have the quinine notes that Koki Americano has. Ah. So I have added to it a few drops of hops bitters. We have so many bitters on our bar, <laughs> and yet we don't have quinine bitters. No, I've never seen it no, they're by themselves. sale anywhere yeah. there. So I've added some hops bitters for a little more bitterness and some lime bitters just because. And then I don't have Persian limes specifically, or at least right. I don't know that I do. I think I have Florida <laughs> limes. Where they come from. I don't know what the difference is species-wise. So I've put lime juice in from lime and then Schweppes carbonated water. Excellent. 
I don't didn't know what the proportions were either. So, <laughs> but I mean, how bad can it be, right? right. <laughs> so, we want to try it. Sure. Our version of a soft notes. Hmm. Yeah, that's a pleasant cocktail. Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's a fairly low alcohol one, a fairly light, tall drink. Uh, it would be good for a summer patio. Yeah. Rather than an evening of a rainy day in a basement, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's perfectly good. All right, so that was the cocktail. So I just wanted to, thought you'd be entertained by that. Yes, excellent. Wow. I want to look at the rest of these too now. I know, you should look at them later. Mm. <laughs> and as I said, I'll put the put it in the uh, show notes. I it really was quite shocked to find an entire <laughs> cocktail menu built not just around Erasmus Darwin, but around Erasmus Darwin's science poem. Yes. But. He's a great man. What can I say? <laughs> All right. So let us get on to proving or otherwise that. <laughs> <laughs> by listening to the audio from your Erasmus Darwin video. And then we will be convened to discuss much, much more, more. about Erasmus <laughs> oh, Darwin. Yes. So this was at the time the, the longest video I had made to that point. And there was still so much that I didn't. Yeah, if you were making include. it now, you would have just included it all. Yeah, it would have and been like 35 been in, minutes or yeah, something. Just like all your videos now. <laughs> <laughs> all right, here we go. Erasmus Darwin, doctor, scientist, inventor, poet, innovator, organizer, promoter of others, coiner of new words, and all-round polymath. He was the grandfather of the more famous Charles Darwin, evolutionary scientist, and of the somewhat less famous Francis Galton, a polymath in his own right. He was also one of the leading minds of the English Enlightenment, and one of the driving forces of the English Industrial Revolution, an 18th century Renaissance man who had been described by some as England's Leonardo da Vinci, in part because of his tendency to come up with ideas that wouldn't actually be put into practice until centuries later. In many ways, though, Erasmus Darwin's most important role was as a connector of ideas, people, and fields. He created learned societies and dining clubs, had extensive and wide-ranging networks of friends, and devoted much of his energy to communicating his knowledge to the wider public. My own interest in Darwin lies not so much in the deeper etymologies of the words he created, so I won't be tracing many of those, but in the way his career highlights the connection between new ideas and innovations, in science and elsewhere, and the need for new words, or new uses of words, to describe them. This is a fundamental and significant driver of language change. In addition to being a medical doctor and a man of science, Erasmus Darwin had a literary flair, though he was rather self-conscious about his literary endeavors and sometimes published his work anonymously. His literary output included poetry, mostly about nature and science, and he was actually considered to be one of the most influential poets of the 1790s. In his writings, Darwin coined many new words and new senses of old words, some of which made it into regular use. He ranks in the top third of sources quoted in the Oxford English Dictionary, and provides 204 first examples of a word or meaning. So, Darwin was a significant linguistic innovator, and in his poem, The Temple of Nature, he even speculated about the origins of language. But what sorts of words were these? Well, he was prolific at verbing nouns, such as to cauldron, put in a cauldron, to horizon, furnish or bound with a horizon, and to lantern, to furnish or light with a lantern. He also produced new forms of words such as acutish, somewhat acute, blubbery, brineless, freightless, and refreeze. If you're red-blooded and air-breathing, you might have to worry about vampirism, thanks to Dr. Darwin. If that doesn't impress you, you might be amused to know that he was the first person to use the word bottom to refer to a person's rear end. Of course, he also coined a number of scientific terms such as aeration, alluviation, and animology, the study of winds, and is responsible for a number of botanical terms such as sapwood and milk parsley. Some of his terms didn't catch on quite so well, such as devaporate instead of condense, and somnambulation instead of sleepwalking. He suggested branks, probably from a Scots word for a kind of gag for a scold, instead of the mumps, but to no avail. But he is the coiner of tonsillitis, which previously had been referred to by such terms as squinzy, strangulian, and prunella, so thank goodness for that. And speaking of tonsillitis, Dr. Darwin was perhaps one of the most renowned and successful medical doctors of his day, largely due to his sympathetic bedside manner and no-nonsense approach. For the most part, he eschewed nostrums and other such superstitious quackery, emphasizing things like exercise, proper diet, and abstention from alcohol. Though he was a rather obese man himself, so much so that he had a special cutaway table allowing him to sit closer to his food, and when on his medical rounds he would send his driver, also a very large man, into the houses first to make sure the floors would hold, 
After a bout of gout, he gave up alcohol, much to the improvement of his health, and therefore became an advocate of teetotaling. He was so taken with Jacob Schwepp's carbonated mineral water, yes that Schwepp, that he recommended it for its health-giving effects. Oh, and by the way, he was the first to use the verb to carbonate. He was so well thought of as a medical man that no less a personage than King George III offered him the job of official royal physician, which he turned down, and instead produced his great medical and scientific work, Zoonomia, identifying and describing many diseases, and providing a general description of the life sciences. Of course, the name Darwin immediately calls to mind evolution through natural selection, because of the theories of Erasmus's famous grandson, Charles. Well, Darwin Sr. had his own musings about the evolution of all species from one source through the process of natural selection, first expressed in that medical and scientific treatise, Zoonomia. As he wrote in his final great poem on evolution from the origins of life to civilizations, the Temple of Nature, Organic life beneath the shoreless waves was born and nursed in ocean's pearly caves. First forms, minute, unseen by spheric glass, move on the mud or pierce the watery mass. These, as successive generations bloom, new powers acquire and larger limbs assume. Whence countless groups of vegetation spring, and breathing realms of fin and feet and wing. That word, acquired, in the biological sense, was a Darwin coinage, by the way. The elder Darwin seems to have believed that organisms could pass along characteristics acquired during their lifetime, not just genetically encoded hereditary ones. Well, he wouldn't have had a sense of genetics as such. But this idea, now referred to as Lamarckism after its proponent Jean-Baptiste Lamarck and rejected by grandson Charles, is in some ways now being reconsidered in the guise of epigenetics, which suggests that lived experience can have some impact on the way genes are expressed in descendants. But Erasmus did also seem to presage the idea of natural selection, stating in his Zoonomia that organisms competed out of lust, hunger, and security, and that the strongest and most active animal should propagate the species, which should thence become improved, and clearly championed the idea that all life sprang from a single, living filament. And the family motto that Erasmus Darwin adopted was A conquis omnia, everything from shells, which, though he was forced to remove it from the side of his carriage by a paranoid church canon, he kept in his bookplates, in books no doubt read by grandson Charles. However, Darwin's main claim to fame in biology circles is botany. Wanting to isolate his medical reputation from his literary endeavours, he set up the Litchfield Botanical Society as a front for his publications on botany, and his first project in that regard was to translate into English the works of botanist and taxonomist Carl Linnaeus in the form of, believe it or not, a long poem, The Loves of Plants. In addition to outlining Linnaeus's classification system, Darwin explained plant reproduction by personifying plants and describing their, shall we say, amorous activities. Needless to say, this caused some controversy and raised eyebrows in straight-laced 18th century England. I mean, women were reading this stuff. Shocking. Well, Darwin was a progressive thinker and didn't see the need to shield women or other non-specialist readers from accurate scientific knowledge, even about sex. That's why he wrote all of this stuff as a poem. And in writing about the sex lives of plants, Darwin coined the phrases sexual reproduction and sexual propagation, being the first person to use the English word sexual in this biological sense. This poem was paired with another more general and theoretical scientific poem called The Economy of Vegetation, under the joint title The Botanic Garden. Though nominally botanical, this book covered wide-ranging topics on science and industry. And in other writings, Darwin seemed to be the first to clearly describe the process of photosynthesis using carbon dioxide, water, and sunlight to produce food for the plant and give off oxygen, and also suggested the importance of chemical fertilizers such as nitrogen. In writing these poems, Darwin wanted to use plain English words wherever possible rather than Latinate jargon, and found newly coined English compound words more expressive than the Latin. And to make sure he got the vocabulary right, he even consulted famed lexicographer Samuel Johnson. Darwin was the chief organizer of the Lunar Society, a group of scientists and industrialists who were the driving force behind the English Industrial Revolution, so called because of their habit of holding their dinner meetings at the full moon, so they could find their way home in those days before street lighting. Darwin was known as a sociable man and a great supporter of the work of his friends, and his fellow lunatics, as they were sometimes called, included the likes of James Watt, of steam engine fame, Joseph Priestley, the discoverer of oxygen, and Josiah Wedgwood, of pottery fame. Wedgwood later became a Darwin relation by the marriage of the former's daughter to the latter's son, founding the great Darwin-Wedgwood family, whose wealth, it could be said, made possible Charles Darwin's voyages compiling evidence to support his evolutionary theory. 
Erasmus Darwin invented a horizontal windmill to power Wedgwood's machinery, and also worked with Wedgwood's business partner Matthew Bolton on the study of gases, expressing the ideal gas law some 20 years earlier than its official discovery. He was also interested in the electrical research being conducted by the scientific community, coining the term electrical to refer to people working on the new science, thus eventually giving electrical engineers their name. Darwin also had his eye on the big picture, cosmology that is, suggesting in the economy of vegetation that the universe might be cyclical in nature, alternating between a sort of Big Bang and Big Crunch, long before these 20th century terms came into use, describing how suns sink on suns and systems systems crush, and then eventually nature soars and shines, another and the same. In his quest to understand the cosmos, he designed a multi-mirror telescope that used many smaller mirrors to get around the difficulty of building one large perfect mirror, a system which would only be put into use and first constructed in 1979 in Arizona. And Darwin had another roundabout connection to modern space science. He was the first to use the word hydrogen, borrowing Antoine Lavoisier's term from French, formed from Greek meaning water generating, because when it burned, or in other words combined with oxygen, it produced water. Appropriate too, since Darwin was quick to recognize hydrogen's utility as a highly combustible gas, envisioning both a hydrogen internal combustion engine and a hydrogen-oxygen rocket engine, long before liquid-fueled rocket engines became a reality, after Konstantin Tsiolkovsky developed the necessary equations in the 19th century and Robert Goddard first successfully built one in the 20th. Now, Darwin would often hand off his ideas to others to develop them rather than bring them to fruition himself, as, again, he was worried for his reputation as a doctor, not wanting to be known as a mad inventor. These ideas didn't always get developed, however. One such idea was Darwin's copying machine, which he called a polygrapher. It was based on the pantograph system but greatly improved, and though we don't have Darwin's prototype itself, a copy made by it does survive, and it is indeed difficult to distinguish it from the original. The person he gave it to turned out not to have the funds to patent and market it. This was one Charles Greville, a politician and collector of minerals, plants, artworks, and briefly the notoriously picturesque Emma Lady Hamilton, who later on became the mistress of Lord Nelson. But as a footnote to the story, the friendly rivalry among the members of the Lunar Society led James Watt to try to one-up his friend by inventing the copy press, which was capable of making a copy of an already existing document and became one of the primary copying devices in use until the 20th century, manufactured, of course, by James Watt & Co. As yet another footnote, years later, Darwin's other famous grandson, Francis Galton, invented another duplicating system, called the Cyclostyle, capable of sending an image through the telegraph system as a mathematical code, and then reproducing it on the other end, foreshadowing computer graphics. It was based in part on Edison's electric pen duplicating device, developed further by David Gastetner, which itself became the basis of the 20th century mimeograph machine. In addition to duplicating human writing, Darwin also tried his hand at duplicating human speech, this time as a sort of bet, once again demonstrating the good-natured rivalry amongst the lunar ticks. His friend Matthew Bolton was to pay Darwin the sum of £1,000 for devising a machine which could recite the Lord's Prayer, the Creed, and the Ten Commandments. While he didn't manage anything so elaborate, he did purportedly build a machine operated by bellows with artificial tongue and lips capable of convincingly pronouncing Mama, Papa, Map, and Pam, a milestone on the road to speech synthesis. Sometime later, a man called Charles Wheatstone constructed a similar setup. Wheatstone's other claim to fame include the invention of the first practical telegraph system, the concertina, and the stereoscope, which allowed for 3D pictures. Wheatstone also came up with a way of accurately measuring the speed of an electrical signal in a wire, the method later used to measure the speed of light. And he invented the Playfair cipher, used right up to World War II, named after his friend Lion Playfair, the first man to suggest the use of chemical warfare. Erasmus Darwin would not have approved of that last development. Erasmus Darwin's writings, particularly the Botanic Garden and Zoonomia, became a sort of literary guide to science, and were especially influential on the back-to-nature crowd we call the Romantics. Wordsworth and Coleridge, though critical of his old-fashioned 18th-century style of poetry in heroic couplets, were nevertheless deeply influenced by Darwin's natural science. Darwin's scientific poetry was the popular science of its day, and one might compare him to contemporary science communicators such as Carl Sagan, James Burke, Bill Nye, or Neil deGrasse Tyson, in terms of his effect on the popular interest and understanding of science. Perhaps most notably, Mary Shelley was inspired to write Frankenstein with its reanimated corpse by an experiment described in The Temple of Nature. Mary may well have met Darwin as a girl, as her father William Godwin knew him. Years later she recalled, 
Many and long were the conversations between Lord Byron and Shelley, to which I was a devout but nearly silent listener. They talked of the experiments of Dr. Darwin, who preserved a piece of vermicelli in a glass case, till by some extraordinary means it began to move with voluntary motion. She may have confused vorticella, a microscopic organism, with vermicelli, the pasta, or she may have been remembering an actual pasta-based experiment that he did indeed describe. Either way, Darwin did speculate about the spontaneous generation of life, and after all, he put some effort into the mechanical replication of living things, with his speaking machine, and an attempt at making a mechanical bird. And his most famous poem starts with theories about the creation of the world and life. Mary Shelley's other inspiration for the novel was the story of creation of Adam and Eve, as told by Milton in Paradise Lost, which is specifically referenced in the novel. Paradise Lost also in part inspired Joseph Haydn's great oratorio The Creation, for which poet Anne Hunter, nay home, wrote a libretto, which also describes the creation of the planets, including, I suppose, the newly discovered planet Uranus, which its discoverer William Herschel initially named Georgium Cetus, George's star, after his patron King George III, who you remember wanted Darwin as his personal physician. Haydn, being a bit of an astronomy fanboy, visited Herschel, as did novelist Fanny Burney, who, along with poet and librettist Holm, was close friends with Samuel Johnson, a man who liked to surround himself with the intellectual women of the day, and whom you remember was consulted by Darwin about scientific vocabulary. As it turns out, Anne Holm's husband, John Hunter, was a noted Scottish surgeon who brought the scientific method into medicine, and was teacher and friend to Edward Jenner, developer of the smallpox vaccine, an idea that had initially been brought into England from Turkey by Lady Mary Wortley Montague, another close friend of Johnson, who by the way was no great fan of Milton's poetry. And this kind of interconnectedness is indicative of Darwin's central role in the popularization of science. Strangely, though, Darwin himself never really had a notion of the germ theory of disease. Of course, there are other forerunners to Erasmus Darwin in the role of science communicator, such as the Roman poet Lucretius, who wrote On the Nature of Things, a poem that explained the atomic theory of Democritus, the creation of the world, and Epicurean philosophy. He turned to poetry to spread his message more widely among his Roman contemporaries because its sweetness would help make the bitter science palatable, just as, he said, doctors put honey on a cup to make children drink their medicine. This use of poetry as a teaching tool was not original to Lucretius, but his poem was certainly an important influence on Darwin's own choice of poetry as a popularizing medium. Other forerunners include those who translated Isaac Newton's writings for the general public, such as John Newbery, who wrote a children's book version in 1761. And notably, after Darwin, there was the British Association for the Advancement of Science, established in 1831 to obtain a greater degree of national attention to the objects of science and Michael Faraday, an inspiration to the likes of Neil deGrasse Tyson and Brian Cox, who instituted the Royal Institution's annual Christmas lectures, one of the most famous popular science outreaches. Speaking of Faraday, by the way, he was responsible for conveying the discoveries of Charles Wheatstone, remember him, to the larger world, particularly as he moved away from teaching and engaged mostly in research. In keeping with his desire to spread knowledge more widely, Erasmus Darwin was keenly interested in education, particularly the education of women. He even wrote a treatise on the education of women for the benefit of his two illegitimate schoolteacher daughters, Susanna and Mary Parker, which was remarkably practical and included scientific topics such as botany, chemistry, and mineralogy, as well as a knowledge of manufacturing and industry, and how to manage finances. And Darwin counted among his friends a number of women with an interest in science, including Anna Seward and Maria Jackson. Seward, known as the Swan of Litchfield, had a close, possibly romantic relationship with Honora Snade, another Darwin friend who shared his concerns about women's education, also writing on the subject. She later married Lunar Society member Richard Edgeworth, who came up with, though like Darwin often did, failed to develop the idea of the caterpillar track, which he described as a cart that carried its own road. So, Erasmus Darwin was a central pivot point for a wide range of scientific discoveries, inventions, language change, and social progress. And perhaps the driving force of his work a creative impulse and a desire to connect and communicate can best be summed up by his own words. Enlist imagination under the banner of science. It's that inspiration that still drives many science communicators today, and I'll end with one who, like Darwin, combines poetry and science. Baba Brinkman, science rapper whose peer-reviewed Rap Guide to Evolution and other albums show us the continuing value of looking for connections, not divisions, between areas of knowledge. So, uh, long-time listeners of the podcast may remember some previous mentions of Erasmus Darwin. Uh, he came up 
before in episode 28, Coach, or the History and Future of Education, episode 32, Ariadne's Clue, and episode 34, The Gimlet and the Diseases of Colonialism. He's your favorite. He is my favorite. So with all those, uh, you know, previous mentions, I figured I may as well just do an entire piece on him. He's interesting not only for his wide-ranging scientific interests, but also for his word coining and literary efforts. So according to the Oxford English Dictionary's uh, statistics, he is the 770th most quoted source in the OED. <laughs> uh, and that ranking includes multi-author sources such as the Bible and the Times. So right. yeah, he's a single so actually... writer compared to, you know, these works that have many, many writers. Mm -hmm. He provides 68 instances of the first known evidence for a new word, which ranks him as 511th uh, in the OED, with a further 204 uh, earliest citations for new senses of existing words. Yeah, which does seem to be something he was very, very fond of doing. Yes. Yeah. And so uh, he thus comes in at a ranking of 548. So not bad for a person not principally known for his body of literature. So there's one article in particular that I'm indebted to here. It's by Desmond King Helle. I'm not sure how that's pronounced. H-E-L-E. -E. It's a hyphenated name. Desmond King Helle's uh, Erasmus Darwin, Man of Ideas and Inventor of Words. And we'll put the bibliographical reference to that in the show notes. So Darwin began his literary career early on with a published poem about the Prince of Wales. But... <laughs> <laughs> and yes, that's the Prince of <laughs> Wales, not the Please. Prince of... Sorry. Today, for those, I know this won't come out. Everyone will have forgotten it by then. But today was the day that the internet just had so much fun with uh, Trump's mis misspelling of Prince of Wales yes. in a tweet. And I've got to say, it's like everybody suddenly discovered there was a pun in that word. <laughs> and they were like, oh, it's so funny. I'm like, I mean, of all the things to mock him for, it's like and surely that easy on correct. comes up. All the All time. The time. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so yes, the Prince of Wales, not the Cetaceans. Yes. Yes. But of course, he's mainly known for scientific writings, not, you know, just general poems. Literary about stuff, yeah. But the Prince of Wales, or Wales. And in, uh, amongst his scientific writings, what I find most interesting about him is his poetry about science. Mm -hmm. So this is a perfect example of the interdisciplinary ideal and his stated intention, as we quoted in the video. <laughs> in the dulcet tones of my father <laughs> that's right. playing Erasmus Darwin. <laughs> Enlist imagination under the banner of science. I think that's yeah. a great motto. A great motto. Yeah. Even For better than from shells everything. <laughs> yes. <laughs> But it's, I think, a great motto for the recent boom in SciComm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Imagination. The other thing that inspired me to to make that video was that I, I had just recently, at that time, seen the rapper Baba Brinkman, who I mentioned, performing his rap guide to evolution. And a little later, in episode 30 of this podcast, yeah. we interviewed Baba. So. Yeah. So do check that out if you mm -hmm. didn't hear it. It's a really, um, we had a lot of fun t talking to him. And he had done Rap Guide to Evolution, which was particularly tied. And he does mention Erasmus Darwin in it. Yep. And that was all very exciting. He came to Sudbury and uh, gave a show as part of a, a conference here. Mm -hmm. But he also has Rap Guides to many other things, including consciousness, human thought, climate chaos, mm. uh, medicine, and a number of other things. And some, many of those are albums. Or all of those are albums, and some of them are also shows. He has some off-Broadway yeah. shows. So if you go to babbabrinkman.com, and then I'll put the link in the show notes, you can see that material and his music. And it's it's really good. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. musically, it's yeah. good. But also, it's really fascinating to see him doing this very conscious, he calls it peer-reviewed rap. Mm -hmm. And it's a very conscious intersection he works with scholars and academics to try to make this sort of use an accessible type of medium mm -hmm. to to get information across and in particular it's also that progressive element because it's in particular it's a lot of what he's working on is stuff that he wants to drive change he's trying to right. you know he's trying to drive awareness of how science, people science of, literacy science and, literacy and how that but affects specific society but you know evolution and climate chaos and mm -hmm. Those are things that he wants to drive societal change with. Yeah. So the climate chaos one in particular is yeah. quite good. I'm quite fond of that one. And it is a really important mm -hmm. topic. So mm -hmm. 
And he's Canadian. He's Canadian. That's right. <laughs> we almost have to claim our Canadians. <laughs> So when I saw that performance, I noticed the, the parallel between what Baba was doing and what Darwin was trying to accomplish in his day uh, by popularizing and teaching science through poetry, through rhymes. So uh, I think it's, uh, you know, they they really are kind of, they have that same goal of educating yeah. the public. Well, for, I mean, it's for... one that Baba sees explicitly between yeah. himself and Erasmus Darwin. Yeah. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. so a little bit more about... Darwin and his poetic efforts in his day. For a while, he was quite successful as a poet, with his writings becoming the sort of science Bible, if you will, for the various literary types, especially the Romantics. And that makes sense since they were really into the natural world uh, that Darwin was describing, and he did so in such reverential and downright spiritual terms. Mm -hmm. Which is exactly the sort of thing that the Romantics loved. Yeah. yeah. And like the Romantics too, Darwin also was something of a social activist and revolutionary. He was a staunch abolitionist, uh, and he wanted to set up a dispensary for the poor. Mm -hmm. You know, as, as, an, uh, as a at, physician. As, as a physician, this yeah. was something that he saw as being very important. Mm -hmm. He also strongly supported religious toleration and freedom of the press. Right. He also, as I kind of mentioned there, is an ex excellent example of the interconnected world with all these social connections that he has uh, and the people that he either helped or inspired. Mm -hmm. He's well He was well connected in the scientific community, for instance, keeping up a correspondence with the geologist James Hutton, whose contributions to evolutionary science I touched on uh, in episode 39, From Fossil Hunters to Mammoth Cheese. <laughs> <laughs> And Darwin's connection to the evidence for evolution stretches back, in fact, to his own father, who found the first known specimen of a fossilized plesiosaur. Hmm. Not that they knew what it was no, at the time, yeah. but that's kind of an interesting little coincidence. So Darwin's own speculations about evolution go beyond just the origins of life. He was thinking in evol evolutionary terms about a lot of other things, and his great poem, uh, The Temple of Nature, also describes the evolution of civilization, including the development of language. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to read a passage. You have to put on the accent my dad put on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to try an accent. Yeah, I'd like to just right now um, <laughs> apologize for my attempt at an accent in the voiceover when I was reading uh, the, the passage. That was a terrible, terrible idea. I should have never tried to. <laughs> I apologize <laughs> profoundly. From these dumb gestures, first the exchange began of viewless thought in bird and beast and man. And still the stage by mimic art displays historic pantomime in modern days. And hence, the enthusiast orator affords force to the feebler eloquence of words. Thus, the first language, when we frowned or smiled, rose from the cradle, imitation's child. Next to each thought, associate sound accords, and forms the dulcet symphony of words. The tongue, the lips articulate. The throat, with soft vibration, modulates the note. Love, pity, war, the shout, the song, the prayer, from quick concussions of elastic air. Hence, the first accents bear in airy rings the vocal symbols of ideal things. Name each nice change a pulsive powers supply to the quick sense of touch, or ear, or eye. Or, in fine traits abstracted forms suggest, of beauty, wisdom, number, motion, rest. Or, as with reflex ideas move, trace the light steps of reason, rage, or love. The next new sounds adjunctive thoughts recite, as hard, odorous, tuneful, sweet, or white. The next, the fleeting images select, of action, suffering, causes, and effect. Or mark existence with the march sublime, or earth and ocean, of recording time. There's some really nice passages in there, actually. Yeah, yeah. I, I like his style. Also, he subscribes to the gestural hypothesis. Yes, yes. Well, this is the point. So according to his idea, language developed gradually out of gesture and expression, facial mm -hmm. expression, eventually developing the ability to express more and more abstract ideas, an idea which linguists still argue for today. This yeah, is still one, one, of the, of the one of the hypotheses. Yeah. 
this will come up later, but I'm currently listening to Dan Everett's, uh, <laughs> later is in another podcast, but listening to Dan Everett's book on the origin of language. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, there is no fixed consensus on this point Not at by all. any means. No, no. Um, a lot and, of the, different and that hypothesis is as as good as all of them, but you know, it's certainly as well widely supported, yeah. supported by mm -hmm. many people, by yeah. many people. So, so Darwin always included copious explanatory notes with his poetry. <laughs> There's so many reasons he's your favorite person. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you see yourself in him, I know, or an ideal, an idealized version of yes. yourself. <laughs> it's what you aspire to be. Indeed. So he goes on to explain this particular passage that I just read out. He says, uh, there are two ways by which we become acquainted with the passions of others. First, by having observed the effects of them as of fear or anger on our own bodies. We know at sight when others are under the influence of these affections. So children, long before they can speak or understand the language of their parents, may be frightened by an angry countenance or soothed by smiles and blandishments. Secondly, when we put ourselves into the attitude that any passion naturally occasions, we soon in some degree acquire that passion. Hence, when those that scold indulge themselves in loud oaths and violent actions of the arms, they increase their anger by the mode of expressing themselves. And on the contrary, the counterfeited smile of pleasure in disagreeable company soon brings along with it a portion of the reality, as is well demonstrated by Mr. Burke, essay on the sublime and beautiful. These are natural signs by which we understand each other, and on this slender basis is built all human language. For without some natural signs, no artificial ones could have been invented or understood, as is very ingeniously observed by Dr. Reed, Inquiry into the Human Mind. Now we're talking about <laughs> connections to Yes, so this I... Your other current favorite. <laughs> <laughs> well... Favorite in well, some ways. Favorite in terms of you're coming back to him in all of your videos. Yes. You haven't made a video. Yeah. The, like your last four videos have all had um, William, James. William James and his theories of emotion. Yes. And perception. And so this idea, and, and he wasn't even the first to suggest that, but a number yeah. of people have that if you express the outward. If you put the bodily shape of it. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, that in some ways, that's a very ancient idea mm -hmm. that if you put on the images of an emotion. You will start you to have, have those it. emotions. And I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's been part of the discourse around acting for a very long time, yes. for instance. Yeah. So, and, and also, you know, with the mention of Edmund Burke. Mm -hmm. Like your video who, who, on the sublime. <laughs> yes, who comes up all the time too. Yeah. So there's a lot of really neat ideas in Erasmus Darwin that I don't think, you know, people had really kind of connected to them in a long time. Mm -hmm. Now he's, as that note demonstrates, he's synthesizing a lot of other people's work. Yes, yeah. Not that he hasn't also been original, but you know, his his like with many science communicators, his some of his genius lies not in original thinking necessarily, mm -hmm. but in communicating what others have discovered or yeah. thought about. Yeah. Yeah. And he I mean he does credit those yeah, those people absolutely. that he's he's being inspired by. So I mean it's his work is really fascinating to read because mm. you find these these interesting little mm -hmm. things in there. Another passage that is worth quoting includes the, the full description of that Big Bang, Big Crunch, which we abbreviated mm -hmm. in, the, in the video, just because it's such a wonderful bit of poetry. Mm -hmm. Roll on, ye stars, exult in youthful prime. Mark with bright curves the printless steps of time. Near and more near your beamy cars approach, and lessening orbs on lessening orbs encroach. Flowering of the sky... Ye too to age must yield, frail as your silken sisters of the field. Star after star from heaven's high arch shall rush, sink suns on suns and systems systems crush, headlong extinct to one dark center fall, and death and night and chaos mingle all, till o'er the wreck, emerging from the storm, immortal nature lifts her changeful form, mounts from her funeral pyre on wings of flame, and soars and shines another and the same. Isn't that great? <laughs> <laughs> it's good. I like it. I like it. Yeah. And again, not a, a, an original cosmology, mm. but you know, one of many mm -hmm. views of how things work, but well expressed. Yes. So I mentioned that that past experiment that he did actually uh, <laughs> yeah. do. That yeah, you do have to enlarge on that because for yes. reasons of concision, you sort of gloss over it. But 
What, Mary Shelley going, I remember this thing where he passed electricity through pasta and brought it to life. <laughs> like, you got to spend some time on that. <laughs> well, here's the experiment in question described in his notes to the Temple of Nature. In paste composed of flour and water, which has been suffered to become ascescent, the animacules called eels, Vibrio anguilula, are seen in great abundance. Their motions are rapid and strong. Even the organic particles of dead animals may, when exposed to a due degree of warmth and moisture, regain some degree of vitality. So he's making some kind of paste and then sort of letting it go bad, I guess. Yeah, and, and then so... the animal animalcules or whatever it is he called mm -hmm. them, animalcules. Animalcules. How did I don't remember what he said? Animalcules. Right. And what he means by that is like any sort of microscopic life, right? Yeah. So, okay. So he's letting it go bad. So he's not passing electricity through it and making it come to life. No. But he is doing something where he's got a growth medium and yes. he's sort of seeing what seems like spontaneous generation because yeah. you start with something inanimate and animate things are produced. Right. Interesting. That seems to be the the one the, the, the thing that she's referring to. Right, right. Unless she is misremembering the word as right. vorticules or whatever they were. Yeah, very interesting. Now, some some of the other scientific work he was involved in is also quite interesting. Uh, in addition to the life sciences, Darwin also made important contributions to meteorology, explaining cloud formation, weather fronts, and suggesting the utility of weather maps, and invented weather measuring instruments. And as I mentioned earlier, he coined that term, well, various terms, uh, such as that word animology and devaporate. Darwin attempted yet another replication of the natural world in his creation of the mechanical bird, which is an important milestone both in the fields of aviation and animatronics, as we now call it. Uh, though obviously Darwin didn't invent that word, it was in fact invented by Walt Disney. Animatronic. Mm, interesting. Mm-hmm. Darwin was a great supporter of the work on steam power uh, being done by his friend, his friends Watt and Bolton, uh, and even came up with his own design for a steam-powered car in 1763, uh, which he offered to Bolton to develop, but alas, Bolton, like Greville, never developed it. And six years later, Nicholas Joseph Cugnot built the first actual steam-powered automobile. Hmm. Darwin did, however, manage to put into practice numerous improvements to the carriage, important <laughs> to him. <laughs> discussed in Coach, coach yep. the video Coach, mm -hmm. and the pod podcast episode Coach, Indeed. yes. Uh, it is important to him since he spent a lot of his time traveling the countryside making house calls on for his patients. Right. So he's a doctor who made house calls. <laughs> well, as everyone, as, as everyone all doctors did, did really at, at the that time, time. Yes. yes. <laughs> so he made his carriage more stable with a smoother ride and devised a novel steering system still used in cars today, though now known as the Ackerman steering because Darwin didn't want to patent the idea himself. And so it was later kind of reinvented by Georg Lankensperger and subsequently patented in English by his agent Rudolf Ackerman, which is a good thing that it was then got named after Ackerman rather than Lankensperger because that's much harder to say. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, there you go. He he doesn't, he didn't patent his ideas. Right. He, he was kind of an open source guy. Yeah, no, I remember I was talking about that in some other context about mm -hmm. his being sort of a pioneer of that idea that getting the credit or keeping control of the invention was not the point. It's, no, it's getting the doing idea. as much as you can to to make the things happen. Yeah. yeah. Which is why he handed them off to people who he thought could actually do you it. Know, pull it off. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I know you're still going to talk more about Darwin, mm -hmm. but you said that it, this was a good time for me to talk, uh, give a little background to science poetry and this intersection between, because as you said, He's a communicator, and as you said in the video, he's not the first person to write science in the form of poetry. No. And I suspect he knew he knew of oh, we, we, earlier. Uh, there was poems zero and, and doubt in my yeah. mind that he knew of earlier or of some of this earlier stuff. Yeah. So he's in, working in a tradition, and while today it seems novel and odd, like mm -hmm. we talk about Baba Brinkman as being unusual, you know, that he's using music and and poetry to communicate science. That's novel not that he's the only person we actually i think you're going to talk about some other people we know who do that kind of crossover stuff yeah uh, later but you know we still think of it as being sort of unusual mm -hmm. 
in fact, for a long time was very quite common. So let me just give a little bit of background for where that comes from. The first poetry we have in the sort of tradition that becomes the English tradition of communicating science through poetry is Hesiod, hmm. our first didactic poetry right. in Greek. So Hesiod is uh, somewhere between the 8th and 6th century BC, and he's a Greek poet, and he writes in hexameters, and he writes two, he, he's the sort of father of didactic poetry. Though that term didactic, which means teaching, was not actually used as a genre term in the ancient world, so they didn't... Right. They distinguished in the sense that you can definitely see genre characteristics of didactic, but they didn't name it when they were listing the t types of genres, which they would do. Didactic poetry didn't sort of have its own category, but we use that term for it. But formally, it's it's being written in the same meter as, as epic. epic. And yet at the same time, it's clearly not epic. So, you know, right. the Georgics by Virgil, which is another one we could talk about, Nobody calls that an epic. So there is, there's a sort of a range of different terms that were used. Okay. But basically, didactic poetry is just teaching poetry. That can be, doesn't have to be science, right? That can be moral or ethical or all sorts of other practical, all sorts of things. But of the two works that Hesiod wrote, one is Works and Days, which is very much sort of practical and astronomical and farming, and you could call that science. But I actually think his Theogony is more rightfully called a science, even though we would say, OK, it's it's myth, it's myth but it's a cosmology. Mm -hmm. I mean, the whole point of it is how where did the world come from? And he starts from there was nothing. And then this is how it was created. So it sets out a cosmology and a cosmology is science. Mm -hmm. So I would say that sets up the mode of scientific poems. And for a long time afterwards, that basic standard, which is the didactic poetry is written in hex hexameter, which is the same meter as epic, and that Hesiod stands as the sort of constant reference. So that especially in introductory passages, you again and again have a calling back to Hesiod in one way or another. So I could give you just a little tiny sense of what that poem is like, if you want, uh, in English, of course. So, you know, it, it is very much poetry written in a, in a religious context in that it starts from the Heliconian muses, let us begin to sing, then goes on to be, you know, then let us start from Zeus, from whom everything comes. So the opening is, is about these things. After a bunch of preamble of sort of a little hymn to the muses and to Zeus, this is what his poem is going to be about. He asks the muse to tell him, Tell how the, at the first gods and earth came to be, and rivers and the boundless sea with its raging swell, and the gleaming stars and the wide heaven above, and the gods who were born of them, givers of good things, and how they divided their wealth, and how they shared their honours amongst them, and also how at the first they took many folded Olympus. These things declare to me from the beginning, you muses who dwell in the house of Olympus, and tell me which of them first came to be. And then he starts, right. at first chaos came, but then earth and Tartarus and... You know, and goes on about that. So while it's framed in what we would think of as mythological terms now, hmm. I mean, what is that but a description of how everything in the world came to be? Right. <laughs> you know, that's cosmology. So we have Hesiod then starting our genre. Not that there wasn't poetry in other places and times, I'm sure, that did similar things. But in, a in, the, in our continuous tradition, European tradition, this is where we can start. And then what we have is there's more poems like that in the 5th and 4th centuries, but in the 3rd centuries in particular, 4th and 3rd century BC, we get a lot of this in, a, in the period of the Hellenistic period in Alexandria. It becomes a real fashion for it. Mm. So we have these earlier didactic poetry, like Hesiod, and there's a, a philosopher Parmenides, and there's Empedocles, these people do philosophy, um, ph sort of natural science and philosophy in poetry. They're very concerned with moral and ethical and philosophical things. And then in the Hellenistic period, didactic poetry becomes very specialized and deals with specialized and very, sometimes very obscure topics. And it becomes a showcase of sort of poetic dexterity and how yeah. amazing it is that you can sort of do these lists and very obscure topics in poetry. Right. A lot of that work doesn't survive, but we know there was a lot more than we have. But we do have, for instance, Nicander, who flourished in around the second century BCE, his surviving, he had many works that don't survive. His surviving works include the Theriaca, which is a hexameter poem about just under a thousand lines long on the nature of venomous animals and the wounds which they inflict. <laughs> and also the Alexipharmaca, which is 630 lines, treating of poisons and their antidotes. So you mm. guys can see his. So, 
you know, that's what I mean by obscure and specialized. Then we also have a little bit before that in, we have Ar Aratus, I never know whether to call him Aratus or Aratus, about 315 to 310 BC to 240. Mm -hmm. And his surviving work is the Phenomena, which was about astronomy, the first half of it, and the second half was weather lore. Yeah. And it is something which comes back with Erasmus Darwin. It was a versification of prose treatises. And this is so right. something that happens okay. in the Hellenistic period is you take, as people have written, you know, learned mm -hmm. treatises on astronomy. Mm -hmm. And then people come along and turn those into poetry to show off, essentially, or for maybe other reasons as well. But that's certainly that's one the of the That's the psychom, taking the original research yes. and turning it into... And Darwin did that too, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. He has one, one of his works Linnaeus, is, is the translation of... Of, translation of, yeah, the, the, on the loves of plants that mm -hmm. we talked about right at the beginning, is a translation of Linnaeus. So mm -hmm. it's exactly in that tradition. And that really also takes us to what we have in Lucretius, who I'll get to in just a moment. But I also have, just to give you a flavor of the phenomena, I, I couldn't find any of the text of the poisonous creatures oh, in right. English uh, online, so I don't have that. But the phenomena, so that's Eratus about astronomy. You know, he, st he starts like Hesiod does from Zeus, let us begin. We have to start with Zeus. So he's very self-consciously in the tradition of Hesiod. Mm -hmm. But then he goes on to say... For himself it was who set the signs in heaven and marked out the constellations, and for the year devised what stars chiefly should give to men right signs of the seasons, to the end that all things might grow unfailingly. Wherefore, him do men ever worship first and last. But for me, too, in answer to my prayer, direct all my lay, even as is meet, to tell the stars. And then he just launches in. They, all alike, many though they be, and the other stars in their path, are drawn across the heavens always all through all time continually, but the axis shifts not a whit, but unchanging is forever fixed, and in the midst it holds the earth in equipoise and wheels the heaven itself around. On either side of the axis ended in two poles, but and then he goes he just sort of goes through the constellations one by one in this right. in almost just a list, but with sort of decorative mm -hmm. listing. So that's Eratus. And these Hellenistic poets were very influential on Roman poets in particular. Right. They were quite important to even to poets who didn't write didactic they were still important to them mm -hmm. but most importantly to us we have uh lucretius who draws on this whole tradition mm -hmm. so lucretius is writing in the first half of the first century bc mm -hmm. we don't have exact dates and the poem he writes is usually known as de rerum natura which is translated as on the nature of things right and it's in six books, in Dactylic Examiner, in the tradition of Hesiod, and all of these other poets. And its topic, as you said, in the it was essentially explaining the entire world, how everything worked. Right. I mean, it was really, in a sense, very comprehensive. It has some ethical philosophy in it, in that it's trying to explain why we should not be afraid of death, and we should not be superstitious. Mm -hmm. um, and his basic reason is you shouldn't be afraid of death because the soul is not eternal, and so nothing will happen to you after you die. So, you know, it's a sort of almost back backwards mm -hmm. comfort. But the comfort is once you die, you won't know that you're dead. So there's nothing to be afraid of. Right. And from that, he then says, therefore, if you aren't afraid of death, all these other things that people do that are immoral mm. stop happening because they're all driven by the fear of death. Right. But his main point is to explain the Democritus's theory of atoms, for instance. So, again, you know, it starts off with sort of a hymn to Venus and then a fairly large encomium of the guy who hopes will become his patron. <laughs> so I'll skip over that. that. That's his Patreon pitch? His Patreon pitch, absolutely. But it's to a very particular person. So it's his uh, sponsorship pitch, right. shall we say. But I will just give you sort of what he describes. So he's talking to Memmius, this guy he wants to be his patron. And he says, what I'm going to do. I will set out to discourse to you on the ultimate realities of heaven and the gods. I will reveal those atoms from which nature creates all things and increases and feeds them and into which, when they perish, nature again resolves them. And then he says, To these in my discourse I commonly give such names as the raw material or generative bodies or seeds of things, or I may call them primary particles because they come first and everything else is composed of them. So that's, that's his topic, is explaining atoms and then from there how all of the world exists. And just so that people can, you know, he's often said to be the first person to write that survives about atomic theory. Obviously, he didn't fully understand atomic theory. And, you know, among other things, he thought you couldn't split the atom. Right. And he didn't know what an atom really was. But just he goes through and sort of lists off these these axioms. Mm -hmm. And one of them that it describes this is 
Material objects are of two kinds, atoms and compounds of atoms. The atoms themselves cannot be swamped by any force, for they are preserved indefinitely by their absolute solidity. And that's the premise, that atoms are unbreakable. Right. Okay, so that's sort of, you know, and that's what the whole, there's, there's very poetic passages, but this is a description of science mm -hmm. in poetry. What is interesting, given our discussion of Darwin, is that he, he too says, I have to make, well, he says explicitly, what Darwin maybe doesn't say explicitly, that he needs to make up new words. Right. He can't do this mm -hmm. in the language he has. So he says, and this is a common, a common thing for Roman poets to say in particular, I am well aware that it is not easy to elucidate in Latin verse the obscure discoveries of the Greeks. <laughs> The poverty of our language and the novelty of the theme compel me often to coin new words for the purpose. But your merit and the joy I hope to derive from our delightful friendship encourage me to t face any task, however hard. <laughs> <laughs> this it is that leads me to stay awake through the quiet of the night, studying how, by choice of words and the poet's art, I can display before your mind a clear light by which you can gaze into the heart of hidden things. So that idea of having to coin words. Now, that's something that Roman philosophers say fairly frequently. Right. Uh, Cicero does the same thing. A lot of our, uh, or a fair amount of sort of philosophical language that we have in Latin it comes from the Latin that he coins to mm. deal with Greek words mm -hmm. uh, when he's writing. So later Cicero writes philosophy, but in prose. But I just think that's an interesting yeah, parallel yeah, yeah. to Darwin. To, to Darwin, mm -hmm. yeah. So that's Lucretius. So absolutely. Now he... He was very influential and important, Lucretius was. He then, um, his works disappeared and were not rediscovered. We, we knew about him, but didn't have the works until the 15th century, when one manuscript was discovered and then subsequently lost after being copied, yeah. which is the story of many, <laughs> the story of Catullus too, right? right? One manuscript is all that makes it through, even though all of our authors that do survive talk about them, right? right? Like mm -hmm. these people who are really well known barely made it through. So Lucretius barely made it through, but... When he was discovered, it was a big deal, rediscovered, and his work was propagated pretty fast. So right. there's, no, I, I think there's zero chance that Erasmus Darwin didn't know Lucretius well, yeah. frankly. Yeah, I think so. So I wanted to come back to this this whole shell thing, right? And his um, a conquis omnia motto on his, his family crest, everything <laughs> from shells. And we'll, by the way, put an image of that crest uh, in the show notes. Okay. And also the connection of that shell imagery to Venus. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that you say that there's the, that the poem starts with an invocation to Venus. Yes, it starts with the idea that Venus is the foundation of all things. I can, can read that little bit of it yeah. if you want, then, since if that's relevant. And it's interesting because he elsewhere in the work, he argues that the gods, as told in myth, do not exist, and that the gods that do exist live off in a far off land and never interfere with humans and in no way can hear humans' prayers right. and are therefore essentially non entities as right. far as. So. As you might have mentioned, there's lots of discussion about how he opens with this conventionalized mythological. Yeah, it's just a literary frame. convention, yeah. I guess. Yeah, I think it might be a little more than that, but but it, yeah, it's it's complicated. So he starts with mother of Aeneas and his race, delight of men and gods, life giving Venus. It is your doing that under the wheeling constellations of the sky, all nature teems with life, both the sea that buoys up our ships and the earth that yields our food. Through you, all living creatures are conceived and come forth to look upon the sunlight. Before you the winds flee, and at your coming the clouds forsake the sky. For you the inventive earth flings up sweet flowers. For you the ocean levels laugh, the sky is calmed and glows with diffused radiance. When first the day puts on the aspect of spring, when in all its force the fertilizing breath of Zephyr is unleashed, then, great goddess, the birds of air give the first intimation of your entry. For yours is the power that has pierced them to the heart. Skipping over a little bit more. Since you alone are the guiding power of the universe, and without you nothing emerges into the shining sunlit world to grow in joy and loveliness, yours is the partnership I seek in striving to compose these lines on the nature of the universe for my noble Memmius. For him, great goddess, you have willed outstanding excellence in every field and <laughs> everlasting fame. For his sake, therefore, endow my verse with everlasting charm. And then he has a paragraph where he says... Oh, and also, could you end war, by the way, because war is bad. So go and um, ha go and dally with Mars like you do yeah, so often right. and soothe him to sleep. And then there won't be any war. And then Memmius will be able to stay at home and listen to poetry. <laughs> Very clever, really. Yeah, good. That also is in some ways a Hesiodic idea because mm. Hesiod starts with chaos. But the oldest god in Hesiod after chaos is Eros. 
the force of love oh. or lust, which then drives all further creation. Okay. So Eros isn't Venus, but you mm-hmm. know, there's this this same idea that Venus is the fount of all creation because she causes procreation. Right. She causes fertility. So yeah, so that's how he starts. Well, for Darwin, the shell becomes a symbol of the creation of life, and by extension, the famous imagery of Venus on the shell in Botticelli's The Birth of Venus, especially in light of the idea of the creation of life, which he kind of gets at in this this passage from The Temple of Nature, and he specifically references Venus here. Rose young Dione from the shoreless main, type of organic nature, source of bliss, emerging beauty from the vast abyss. Sublime on chaos born, the goddess stood and smiled enchantment on the troubled flood. The warring elements to peace restored, and young reflection wondered and adored. Now, paused the nymph, the muse responsive cries, sweet admiration sparkling in her eyes. Drawn by your pencil, by your hand unfurled, bright shines the tablet of the dawning world. Amazed, the sea's prolific depths I view, and Venus rising from the waves in you. So, of course, my mind, sorry, now I'm just going to do a little bit of critical uh, Mm. poetry poetry (laughs) criticism. He knows his Hesiod and his Lucretius, right? right? Because she rises on chaos. Mm. That's Eros coming out of chaos. That's Hesiod right at the beginning. And then she looks upon and and stills the warring nature. Mm. That's a reference to Lucretius and Right. How Venus can cause peace to come across the right. world, quite apart from the other stuff, which is all obviously drawn from both these sources and also just generalized mythology. Right. Yeah. And furthermore, there might be a Venus reference in the frontispiece to the Temple of Nature. Mm-hmm. And we'll put an image of that also in the show notes. So De Rerum Natura by Lucretius does seem to indeed be have been a major inspiration for Darwin's creation poem. And as you said, opens with an invocation to Venus as a symbol of creation. So mm-hmm. that seems to be where he's getting that idea. And if you compare the frontispiece of the translation of Lucretius written by John Evelyn, your old friend, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you can spot an interesting parallel. The curious thing is in both cases, the, the Venus figure is pictured with many breasts. I remember I mean, this is all coming back to yeah, me yeah. us looking at all of this before mm-hmm. the video and this, then deciding there was no way you could put it in the video. It was far too complicated. So, and that that's a motif that is now associated with the cult image of Artemis mm-hmm. at the temple of Ephesus. The, Apparently, I guess there is now some dispute as to whether they're breasts or something else on the statue. Like bull testicles. Yeah, because, you know, that makes as much sense. <laughs> they, whatever they are, they're almost certainly an image of fertility, though. Right. I think that that, which is one of the interesting things of associating with Artemis, mm-hmm. the notoriously virgin, virgin goddess. goddess yeah. <laughs> though she isn't in her eastern. Anyway, lots of <laughs> Shan't go into that. <laughs> well, it seems this sort of multi-breasted Artemis Diana figure might have become a general nature symbol in the Renaissance. Mm, mm-hmm. And that would make sense for frontispieces for On the Nature of Things and uh, the Temple of Nature. Mm-hmm. So maybe they don't represent Diana or Venus, but some generalized nature figure, or maybe uh, there are elements of both Diana and Venus subsumed into this this figure one figure yeah i'm not really sure but if anyone yeah i i don't know enough about the history of the reception of the diana Mm. of ephesus the artemis of ephesus figure Mm -hmm. because i would not at all be surprised if people didn't always think she was artemis right and i mean to touch on the thing that i said i wouldn't talk about is that you know syncretism there's an overlap with other east more eastern cults right um and there's the potnia thera idea the lady of the beasts the mistress of the beasts Uh. which is connected to mother goddess figures like you know artemis has various other forms artemis is also the the goddess associated with childbirth Mm. for instance you know there's other elements to artemis other than the sort of central virgin huntress goddess Mm. that we know from myth and so I don't know what the reception of that stat like I don't know what the seventeenth century thought that statue represented, basically. Right. I don't know if they thought it was Diana or what they thought it meant. So I'd be yeah, I'd be interested if anyone has any knowledge about those that period's reception of that piece. Because it's a very curious figure and very like it stands yeah, out. It's, it's, <laughs> yeah, it is. Well, 
Again, Darwin has a sort of explanatory note about that Venus passage that I read out. Mm -hmm. uh, he says, uh, the hieroglyphic figure of Venus rising from the sea supported on a shell by two tritons, as well as that of Hercules armed with a club, appears to be remains of the most remote antiquity. As the former is devoid of grace and of the pictorial art of design, as one half of the group exactly resembles the other. And as that of Hercules is armed with a club, which was the first weapon. The Venus seems to have represented the beauty of organic nature rising from the sea and afterwards became simply an emblem of ideal beauty while the figure of Adonis was probably designed to represent the more abstracted idea of life or animation. Some of these hi hieroglyphic designs seem to evince the profound investigations in science of the Egyptian philosophers and to have outlived all written language, and still constitute the symbols by which painters and poets give form and animation to abstracted ideas as to those of strength and beauty in the above instances. Right. So this is a sort of combination of anthropological before there's anthropology and, uh, you know, investigation or understanding of mythological symbols and art. Right. Yeah. And, and then also sort of art critique. Yeah. I'm sure that's all sort of at the forefront of thought about these things, about myth and, you know, it's the rationalist humanist approaches to these right. things mm -hmm. of the time. So I have a few other little interesting extra connections, random Mm -hmm. connections. In addition to being an astronomer, Herschel, uh, who we heard about, was also a composer. Yes. Though he's now more known, obviously, for his astronomical contributions than his musical ones. But nevertheless, there's another interesting connection with, well, with Haydn. the composer Haydn. As for and Baba Brinkman. <laughs> and Baba Brinkman. That's right. As for Haydn and Anne Holm, the libretto that she wrote for the, con for the uh, creation was not the original one, but was an alternative text meant to replace an earlier clumsy one that had apparently been translated from English to German and back to English. So you can imagine, you know, a mm -hmm. Google like translation error <laughs> sort of document. Mm -hmm. But this wasn't the first musical collaboration between those two. Haydn had earlier set a number of Holmes's poems to music. So I suppose she was kind of returning the favor. Mm -hmm. Holmes's husband, John Hunter, and his friend Edward Jenner also have a small footnote in the story of evolutionary science. Not that they would have known it at the time, but it's a kind of an interesting example of something uh, that is accounted for by evolution. Mm -hmm. Jenner was the first person to describe the special adaptation the cuckoo chicks use in the process of brood parasitism. So it had been believed that the adult cuckoo Depositing, depositing its eggs in another bird's nest, knocked the other eggs out. But as Jenner described to Hunter in a letter published in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, quote, the singularity of the cuckoo chick's shape is well adapted to these purposes. For, different from other newly hatched birds, its back, from the scapula downwards, is very broad, with a considerable depression in the middle. This depression seems formed by nature for the design of giving a more secure lodgment to the egg of the hedge sparrow or its young one when the young cuckoo is employed in removing either of them from the nest. When it is about 12 days old, this cavity is quite filled up and when the back assumes the shape of nestling birds in general. Right. So they're saying that the cuckoo chicks have, have evolved, though they don't know that terminology, to be able to actually themselves dump the, dump eggs, the eggs of the other bird out. Yeah. And they have this special formation on their back to do it. Yeah. yeah. And that's the sort of thing that Charles Darwin, that's the sort of observation that Charles Darwin would Used later to use. to construct his, yeah. his theory. So he yeah. noticed all kinds of special adaptations in birds in particular mm -hmm. to show how they were adapted for very particular functions. And that, of course, also connects us to our cuckoo video. The <laughs> that's cuckold, right. The cuckold, the cuckold yes. video. Yeah. So the final thing that I, I think we want to talk about is about science communication in general in, in today's world. Yeah, the current science communication. Mm -hmm. There was a, a 2013 episode of the Infinite Monkey Cage uh, radio show, which is co-hosted by Brian Cox. And the panel included James Burke. For one Your thing. real, actual My hero. hero. Yes, <laughs> like, that's right. Even more than Rasmus Darwin. Uh, among other 
science communicators, uh, and they discussed the state of science communication at that time. 2013? 2013. Which is already six years ago. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. So in that discussion, they don't actually mention YouTube at all as a platform for science communication, uh, but Burke predicts a renaissance of some science communication online. And in the years since this, since that time, uh, this prediction has borne out with the popularity of SciComm YouTube channels, mm -hmm. of which sure. we are quite big fans of many. Yeah, yeah. In particular, I'd like to give a, a shout out to the science channels who are fellow members of the We Create EDU uh, group that we belong to. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of great... There's, I, you're not going to be able not gonna to mention them all. I'm not going to be able to mention them. them all, but there's so many of them. Mm -hmm. So they can discover some of them by going to our playlist, right? The, the, the WCE playlist. Yes, there are various playlists, but I will I will put some links to the WC play some video playlists of one or more sorts. Yes, for sure. So if you're if you're hunting around for some good YouTube science channels, yeah, that are that, that are doing good work and that are accurate <laughs> and also entertaining, yeah, for sure. And they they cover you know everything from like biology and the environment to physics and one I don't know if you were going to name any of them individually, but one I would like to call out specifically because of the connections and things is acapella science. Yes, because of he That's too does music. Yeah, science communication through music. He yeah. does mainly he writes some of his own music I think as well, but mainly he does parody, parody versions, versions, versions of famous songs of songs. They're amazing, and his videos are like astonishing in yeah. their production quality. And he does them all a cappella, and he records eighty-five thousand tracks of himself, and they are really amazing. But the point being that he's doing like Baba Brinkman, he uses um, song and rhyme and song, so forth, yeah, to to do real accurate science communication of accurate mm -hmm. meaning. Yeah, that's not any way to not mention all the other WCE people, but just because his link is there. Yeah, and there's. A lot of other people doing stuff that isn't on YouTube, of course, too. Like we have colleagues who are doing some really interesting work in SciComm at our university. We do. One of them, and there's actually quite a few, and there's some good work just happening in Sudbury in general, actually. But one of them that I should call out, and, and I think we would be good to talk to him on the podcast at mm -hmm. some point, is Thomas Merritt, who works on, he's a Canada research chair at Laurentian biology and he works on flies <laughs> studying mm -hmm. genetics in flies uh fruit flies and he does things like breed fruit flies at the bottom of the snow lab mine mm -hmm. <laughs> which is really kind of cool but also he does a lot of a lot of work on outreach like in schools and online and yeah. he's very involved in in trying to do science communication and one of the things he does and one of the things that's very good here in Sudbury is science north does a lot of yeah. um outreach mm -hmm. i mean it's a science centers of course it's all about science communication but it has these like panels where it has science cafes where yeah. it has brings various scientists and there is of course a science communication program at Sudbury yeah that is a Laurentian, collaboration yeah. between Laurentian and Science North yes yeah and so it's really good work and mm -hmm. I think they're doing and it's, it's fairly new as a program um, and I think it's doing really good stuff so yeah that's something we can you know we may mm -hmm. want to talk about in more detail mm -hmm. another episode and in particular uh the the one thing that I wanted to mention about Thomas Merritt's work is the recent recently produced Fractal Dance. Oh yeah, that's right. Of course. Yeah, he's also been very yeah, he in for the last few years he's been involved in putting on exhibits at Laurentian of uh science and art, like mm -hmm. art inspired by science and art that teaches science. So there's been art exhibits. Yeah. No, then that's very connected yeah, to so what that's you were talking that, about. Uh the the music teacher at the at the school composed the the score for this, and the students were involved in performing in this in this work. Mm -hmm. So I would say that in many ways, you know, modern media like YouTube or Baba Brinkman's peer reviewed rap guides have indeed led to a science communication renaissance in which we are kind of living up to Darwin's motto of enlisting imagination under the banner of science mm -hmm. absolutely there's really good work being done on that mm -hmm. and i think erasmus darwin would approve mm -hmm. i have one coda i want to add even though that's such a good place to end <laughs> to go back a little bit in time though not all the way back to erasmus darwin to another 
piece of science communication that is close to my heart, specifically of science poetry. And that's a work by my mother, the poet, Mm -hmm. (laughs) Susan McMaster, who, if you want to know more about, we have an interview with her and my father and an episode I don't remember the number of. (laughs) Because you forgot to look it up. Because I forgot to look it up. But my mother has written many books of poetry, but one of her first ones was in 1986, and it's called Dark Galaxies. And it's actually in two halves. The second half is mostly Black Bear, Mm -hmm. um, the cottage. But the first half is inspired by Scientific American articles at the time. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not science communication in the same way that Darwin or Lucretius is. They are poems inspired by science Mm -hmm. rather than trying to explicate science. So they're not not poetry that's trying to teach Mm -hmm. us about it. But the construction of it is she has quotations from the Scientific American articles and then a poem that sort of responds to it. And I do think, though, it is um, a form of engagement. You know, it's bringing awareness and it's bringing engagement uh, with cutting-edge science because, uh, in particular, she was responding to a number of articles on astronomy and quantum physics. So this dark galaxies, dark matter, was just becoming a big thing. And quantum mechanics and quantum physics and the sort of quantum world, both in 1982, right? These are things that are are not really in the popular imagination yet. Mm-hmm. And Scientific American is an, a magazine that is doing that work of bringing it to a popular audience. And uh, my it's always the magazine my dad read, and and she's responding to it. So it's not deliberate didactic poetry in the same way as these other people we've been talking to talking about. But I do think it it is. You know, you can group it in that world of the intersections. If we're talking about the connections and the intersections and the interdisciplinarity between poetry and and science, it certainly is an example of that. So I'm just going to read two poems, I think, from the Dark Galaxy section of the book. And they're both quite short, and I think they give a good flavor of what my mom was doing. And I think they're good. So this is called Dark Matter, and it starts with the quotation from Scientific American. To account for the motion of stars within galaxies and galaxies within clusters, it is necessary to suppose the gravitational influence of more mass than can be detected directly, as much as ten times more dark matter than luminous matter. The pull that holds us together can't be explained just by our words, by the things we do. What can account for my wandering ellipse, your far-flung loop, how we keep returning against all sense? Baffled by light, I peer not at stars, but at dark distances between, see streams of ancient particles pouring everywhere, ghostly dimensions overlapping ours, old lumpy debris scattered here and there, burnt-out daydreams one's about to form. How much of the pull in our strange quirky dance comes from matter too tenuous to shine? Dark galaxies. This is called Quantum World, the excerpt from Scientific American, We can never predict the future of a quantum universe with complete certainty, for in an infinite quantum future anything that can happen will eventually. If you have trouble holding on, if you can't understand why things are exactly as they appear, or else never that at all, then it makes perfect sense that the whole fine structure could dissolve at whim, something come from nothing, be here, there, or nowhere, stars change their courses at the bid of a random need, and a heart that beats or dies without known cause is just reason breaking free. And on that note, I think we can put to rest Erasmus Darwin for another <laughs> night. <laughs> oh, he'll always he'll make come a comeback. Back, I know, but we can put him to bed for now. <laughs> I, I do think it's a shame that that video is one of our least viewed videos. Yes. Because it, I understand why it is. There's a hard sell and nobody's searching Erasmus Darwin out there. (laughs) Why not? (laughs) But it is, I really do think, Mm -hmm. a fascinating story of a fascinating person and a fascinating time in scientific and philosophical and linguistic history. Mm -hmm. So thanks for listening. And we'll be back sometime this summer for the next month or two is going to be a little complicated. Mm. So I'm not totally certain what the schedule of our next few podcast episodes are going to be. So if we do end up missing a little bit, my apologies, but we'll be back on track by August or in August for sure. 
But yeah, July is going to be very full and we're going to be out of touch with the internet for a big chunk of it. Right. <laughs> so we'll see you when we see you. <laughs> right. Good night. Bye-bye. For more information on this podcast, check out our website, www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits, and all our contact info. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is Twitter. I'm at Avensarah, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on your favorite podcast app or to the feed on the website. And if you've enjoyed it, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.